water and energy nexus. And what's interesting about the food, water, and energy nexus is that there are synergies among each of the three sectors. And one of the things I found interesting about the, the Creating Shared Value Report is that they had an emphasis on, uh, Nestle had a, an emphasis on the, at this intersection. If we're gonna go from seven and a half billion people to nine billion people, we're gonna have to think about how we balance food, water, and energy uh, in new ways. We're going to have to have an increased amount of productivity in agriculture. We're going to have to be uh, more creative about the sorts of technologies that we use, as well as the sorts of um, the uh, efficiencies on energy and on water. And I think you'll, you'll hear about that in this conversation. Uh, we're very fortunate to have my friend and colleague, uh, Joanna Nessa Tuttle, who's the Manager of Development and Public Policy at Chevron. And uh, Chevron, as I mentioned earlier, has been a uh, are, uh, are basically the driving force behind our work in helping us with the U.S. leadership and development work about the role of the private sector in development. And Joanna used to be here at CSIS and started our work on food security, and so she maintains an affiliation here on that very topic. So we're very fortunate to have her moderate this conversation, and I'm going to turn it over to her. Joanna? Thanks, Dan. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will say from the outset that I'm always a bit challenged when we bring up the food, water, energy nexus, because to me, a nexus is sort of a circle in the middle where everything comes together. But when I think about food, water, and energy, as Dan said, I think about a triangle where each point of the triangle directly and deeply affects each of the other points of the triangle, but they don't always come together. Energy and water, the pr water production and water uses and water outcomes of energy production are very important. Um, water and agriculture are linked so deeply and so importantly for the future development and production of, of food sources. But it's really hard to talk about all three of them together unless you really zero into something like biofuels or you zero in on, uh, for example, India's case where a large percentage of energy and power is used for water pumps, for irrigation, for agriculture. But, but today I think we're gonna not dive into those specifics quite so carefully. I can talk a little bit about what Chevron does in terms of water, but I think that's gonna be less interesting than really focusing in on the agricultural discussion because there is so much to talk about around rising needs and demands for energy for uh, agriculture production and how do you find the water to meet them because for each of the three pieces of this triangle energy can pr be produced and from different things and in different ways. Agriculture can be produced with different, uh, with different crops in different ways but the one indisputable and immutable component is water. You just can't substitute anything for water. Uh, but there are some different ways to use different kinds of water in different settings. So I think that's really what we're going to talk about today. So I'm with the most distinguished uh, set of gentlemen. I'm like the opposite of Dan, who had an all-woman panel. Um, and I'm going to introduce them real briefly, uh, and we'll hear from them each. Anders Berntel is one of the world's leading water experts and has been working on this topic for his entire career um, out of Sweden. Uh, he's a Swede, I'll, I'll say. We always appreciate having the Nordic countries represented here. Um, and we'll really talk about um, some of his work, followed by Paul Gannett, who has been working on food and agriculture and value chains with smallholder farmers for his entire career. Um, Peter Lockery is, oh, sorry, Christian Holmes will be next. I thought they were switched, but Christian is um, going to talk to us sort of a little bit more broadly about water strategy and water policy. And then we're going to uh, close up with uh, Peter at the end, talking more about sort of the sanitation health, sort of the broader, um, the broader focus on water and water resources. So I want to ask each of you to just say a few words about what you do and how you look at the resources. And then I'm gonna follow up with a few questions and open it to the audience. We have until noon, so we have a little over an hour for a discussion. So Anders, could you please kick us off? Thank you, Johanna. And uh, thank you also to CSIS and Nestle for organizing the event and, and inviting us all here today to discuss uh, these extremely important topics. Um, 
the nexus, yes, definitely what we are doing uh, in our group, which is called the 2030 Water Resource Group, is very much in, within the nexus in, in all the various aspects of it. But I will address this more from the water angle because that's our starting point. The World Economic Forum in their global uh, annual risk report, uh, which is building on the expert opinion about 1,000 experts, uh, business leaders, international organization leaders, etc., has for the last five years ranked water as the amongst one of the five top risks uh, uh, internationally, globally. And this year it came out as number one. Um, which I think says something about what we are challenging. Uh, water availability and sometimes also water quality poses a real risk to business, but also to ecosystems and to people. The CDP water disclosure report has over the last years also reported on the increasing number of companies that share this belief about the fundamental risk. In, and in 2014, 68% of the companies all of them being among the global 500 companies reported that water poses um, a substantive risk to their business and 22% actually reported that the issue around water could limit the growth of their business. So water does pose a real risk to economies, to companies, but also to people and ecosystems. We, the 2030 Water Resource Group, we are a public-private civil society initiative or partnership that has been established um, to address those challenges in selected countries around the world. Uh, we work to create, you could say, shared value, but from a water perspective, with a water entry point. We were established a couple of years ago uh, by a few companies, uh, Nestle, one of them, but also working together with Coke and PepsiCo. Actually, I think we are the only initiative where Coke and PepsiCo sits down together at the table to address a common concern. Uh, but also others, bilateral donors, SDC uh, and uh, others, uh, and IFC got involved, IFC, International Finance Corporation, part of the World Bank Group. Um, and we were hosted initially within the World Economic Forum, uh, but then since 2012 actually uh, moved here to Washington to be hosted by IFC. And the reason we, why we were established is beyond really the self-interest of the companies involved and the concern for their own production and manufacturing of, of products. Uh, we were established because these companies were concerned about what water scarcity and also other water challenges such as quality will do to the economic development of countries where they are operating. Uh, so you call it a, a long-term self-interest. These companies depend on countries where the economy is growing, where development is not jeopardized because of lack of water, where there is political stability, no social unrest caused by water scarcity, etc., and where people's livelihoods is improving, where purchasing power increases. So we operate in countries where, for example, Nestle is not sourcing any of its products, where they only have sales offices. And, and we know that water scarcity and water pollution is already today affecting economies in, in many countries. We see investments being stopped because the investors are not sure that the water that is needed for the operation of the production is guaranteed. We see that in agribusiness in, in Africa, uh, hydropower also, uh, mining in Peru, uh, Chinese coal power plants that are uh, not built any longer because of the lack of water, etc. Uh, or where water quality becomes an issue, not only for people and ecosystems, but also for the industry itself, such as the textile industry in Bangladesh and other industries in, in China and India. So water is really at the core of, of the food, water, energy nexus. Um, and we also know, of course, that the effects of, of uh, the lack of safe drinking water and inappropriate sanitation has uh, vast effects on the economies of these countries. So I said that we are working in, in selected countries. Today it is in, in Mexico and Peru in Latin America, South Africa, Tanzania and Kenya in Africa. And we work in India, uh, in the states of Karnataka and Maharashtra, and now also engaging uh, in the, with the federal government, government with the big Ganga cleanup program. 
Bangladesh and Mongolia. Uh, we've also worked earlier in Jordan. We will continue to add maybe two more countries uh, per year for the next couple of years. What we do in, in these countries is, I believe, rather unique. We, we create a platform where the government in that country can sit down with the private sector within the country and civil society and discuss together what needs to be done to address the water challenges that they are facing and how they can do that by working together. So a multi-stakeholder platform, we call it. We are there to facilitate, but we do not steer the process. Normally, we would look for co-chairs from government and private sector to uh, run this together. We would normally start by doing a, a stakeholder mapping to make sure that we have all the right actors at the table, and then doing some initial analytical work on future water demand uh, based on the country's growth scenarios for agricultural development, for manufacturing industry, for energy production, uh, for urbanization. So how much water would you need to realize that growth? And, and normally what we see there is that there is a gap between demand, future demand and current supply. Uh, because growth is thirsty. Uh, every production uh, has a huge water footprint, in particular agribusiness, of course. So the next question is, how can we close that gap between demand and supply? What are the most cost-effective solutions that we can come up with? And again, we can help with doing some economic analysis. Uh, and normally, reducing the demand is the most cost-effective solution. So moving away from inefficient flood irrigation uh, to drip irrigation in agriculture, or reducing the municipal leakage in the urban water supply system, or recycling, reusing wastewater between industry and municipalities, or vice versa. So identifying the most cost-effective opportunities uh, in the country. And then we help these multi-stakeholder platforms to develop concrete proposals together in these different areas. Today we have such platforms up and running now in seven of the countries where we are operating and, and working now to establish two or three more. Um, and in these countries they have themselves divided them into two working groups. So we have 21 working groups uh, in these seven countries, all in all covering 180 different organizations of which 100 is companies but also government entities and civil society organizations sitting together in these working groups and developing concrete proposals together for their countries. So concrete programs are coming up uh, in various countries. Such, and some of them are PPPs, uh, but some of them can also be purely governmental programs and, and initiatives. Uh, we have a, a so-called no-drop uh, program in, in South Africa, which is really about reducing the, the municipal leakage. So 38% of, of the water that is produced by municipalities in South Africa uh, is just leaking away and not put into practice, practice use. So we have an incentive program by the government to municipalities to reduce that leakage with half. Uh, in Peru and Mongolia, interestingly enough, the private sector themselves said to the government that we don't think that the current tariff system for water uh, supply for us as industry is effective. It doesn't really create an incentive to us to reduce the water consumption. You guys, you government, needs to, to uh, increase the tariffs, uh, put in a new tariff system in, in place, and we can help you to develop that. Uh, but also PPP programs, for example, uh, a program between the mining industry, coal mines, so energy nexus again, uh, coal mines in South Africa, uh, collecting all the wastewater that is normally polluting for everyone downstream, uh, acid mine drainage, and collecting that and treating it, and then uh, with the most advanced um, technology, reverse osmosis, etc and then selling it as drinking water supply to downstream municipalities. So a quite innovative PPP solution. Or a statewide program in, in India where we have the local banks working together with the sugar industry, the government, and the farmers to come up with financial solutions to make the sugar smallholder farmers producing sugarcane to move away from flood irrigation to drip irrigation, uh, for example. 
So various ways of, of closing the gap between the demand and supply in the country, increasing the water security for the benefit of people, ecosystems, but also the economy and thereby indirectly for the companies themselves. So what we do is to address an old challenge in, in a new and innovative way. Uh, I've been working with the government uh, on, on uh, water for a large part of my career. Um, and water is definitely a governmental responsibility. There's no question about that. But government needs to work with others to change the way that water is used in reality on the ground. And the private sector is a large user of water, in particular within the agribusiness uh, supply chain, of course. Peter Brabeck, uh, the chairman of Nestlé, who is also the chair of, of my group, the 2030 Water Re Resource Group, he often describes us as a positive disruptor, that's his word, uh, a meaning that we engage in an area that has been dominated by the public se sector forever and create a new momentum in that sector by bringing new actors to the table. And I believe it works, and I believe that we can show that it does. Thank you. Great, thank you. That was a great overview and starting point. Paul, we want to turn to you, and I think often when I think about agriculture and water, I think about water-saving technologies through inputs and seeds. I also think about really strong but pretty basic land management practices and, and water conservation practices. So I'm hoping that you'll maybe describe some of the work that ACD IVOCA has done in these areas and give your thoughts. Thank you. I'm, uh, I'm humbled to be here, and, and I have to show you, I came with my notes for today and have been so stimulated by, by the discussion <laughs> that this is now my page of printed notes with comments and inserts about things that I have to change what I'm saying. So. Let me, let me just begin by saying, why are, we, why are we here talking about the role of the private sector in agricultural development? We, we this large community, and we're, we're all on the same team, have been wrestling with the developing economies. And, and, and faced with malnourishment across sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, we're now seeing a new opportunity for the private sector. Uh, no one's mentioned yet, so I'll, I'll toss it in here. The, the ratio of investment private to public that has shifted historically, so that now private sector is the big king and the development assistance has to become catalytic. We heard, we heard Margaret describing USAID's Feed the Future program. Now embracing the private sector uh, so that, in fact, the role of the implementation partners, and lots of us are here today, for development assistance, we need to leverage inclusive investment, and I think that we do that by lowering the financial risk of investing in smallholder agriculture. I think that, that we do that with organization of rural communities, of producer groups, training, uh, infrastructure support, teaming, introductions. Lots of people talked about making constructive dialogue happen so that you can overcome that divide, that mistrust, whether it's between the public sector and the private sector or civil society and the private sector. New investment is coming, and it's coming in, and it's all of our jobs to catalyze that and optimize that and make it as inclusive as we can. I think that historically we've seen specialty crops make a deeper, more profound move faster because that's their raw material. I think we're seeing a secondary wave by the input supply companies, seed and fertilizer and tools, because they see a, a market there. But they're coming gently, and they're, they're initially going in with, a, with an agency rep in the capital city and seeing if they can grow their business, a lot more cautiously than the specialty crops folks have. I think that the the implementation partners for the donors who are, who are trying to act as interpreters or translators between economic development and private investment are doing it around uh, building farmer awareness of business skills, market savvy, market information. We heard some descriptors above. Um, the, I, I just want to quick cite some examples uh, DuPont Pioneer and, and USAID's Feed the Future program have done a nice job of partnering and building off each other. Uh, 
The largest fresh horticulture exporter in Kenya, VegPro, has moved into Ghana with help from the Millennium Challenge Authority and, and is producing smallholder extra fine green beans for export to Europe, like they were doing from Kenya, they're now doing from Ghana. Um, there's a sequential uh, PPP that I want to describe. A small USAID enterprise development program in India ran for a couple of years, did some good work. It was ending. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, this is good work. Can we, can we support that for another year? Lo and behold, before that ended, Walmart stepped in and said, we've got a bunch of supermarkets here that need fresh horticulture. Could you organize those women to supply fresh horticulture to the supermarkets? So before you knew it, a little stimulus planting by USAID, supported by Gates, turns into a commercial Walmart uh, product supply channel. There's a new, again, innovation from the specialty crops. The Coffee Quality Institute is the nonprofit arm of the Specialty Coffee Association of America. They're just spearheading a new collaborative research initiative on gender best practices in the global coffee industry. And, and AC Davok has stepped into this partnership. Uh, Mars Drinks is on board. Amphotech and Falcon Coffees and, and CQI is asking for more partners in this initiative. Rural electrification had a big role to play. It, it means that agribusiness becomes possible. It means that education becomes possible. It facilitates the gender. The gender panel that ran just before us was, was inspiring. The gender role and nutrition uh, are coming out of the labor savings from rural electrification. I went back to my Peace Corps village last year, 40 years later, and found that the rural electrification had arrived. And instead of the women spending all day pulling up water in rubber buckets from 25 meters down, there were five capped wells with robinets going to five areas in the village. So the women, didn't have to spend all day pulling up water. So 40 years ago, no vegetables, poor nutrition. We ate grain, we ate dried fish from the river, which was primarily fish bones. This time, vegetables every meal, great food, and the education of the women had paralleled this labor saving. So instead of just two primary classrooms, there was now a lycée in that village because of electrification and because of education, girls were going through high school and then working there in that village which is becoming a city. They're not migrating to the... One last comment from Michael Levitt, replication over innovation. What we're trying to do is complex and it's big, but there are so many easy solutions right there. It, it merely takes more effort and more application to take some good model of a GDA that's worked, take it to five more countries. There's a lot of work to do. Final drop comment, thank you, Anders. The, the role of governments in creating the enabling environment, we've kind of given them an easy pass today, I think. Are there commercial laws? Are there commercial courts? Will contracts be, be respected and, and enforced? Infrastructure, is banking allowed to function? Is an insurance industry allowed to function? Um, maybe I'll just stop there. Lots of ideas that about uh, private sectors, energy, and finance. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, and we'll come back to you with some follow-up questions. We'll turn now to Christian Holmes. You are the water coordinator for USAID and have done a lot of different things in your career, not just on water, but on energy and, and other issues as well. So. We wanted to just ask you to kind of give an overview of the water and development strategy and talk a little bit about each of the components as you see it. Great. So, if, if it's all right with you, would it be all right if I stood up over there because I can't see the people sure. over there? Yeah, no, okay. Thank you. So, I just wanted to see you. You know, you have these wonderful flashbacks. Uh, so. I was sitting over there thinking, I can't see, I can't see, and I flashed back to my son when he was two and little, and he was going, I can't see. And I was going, okay. 
Um, so enough of that. So I um, am very happy to be here. I've worked professionally with everybody around the table. Uh, it's just a fabulous phenomena that such enormous talent is being attracted to this field of water, food, and energy and the nexus between the two. I'm also accompanied today by a number of my eight colleagues, uh, including Margaret uh, Ennis Spears, who's been a great leader in Food for Peace and others from the Office of Water. So in my five minutes, what I'd like to do very briefly is address the points uh, that Johanna suggested, um, begin a little bit with my perspective on the challenge we face, the system's response to that challenge, uh, what we're doing in one element of the nexus, uh, in water in particular, but also talk about how uh, uh, links into food and energy, and then also talk a little bit about the science and technology engagement of the private sector dimension of this. Um, so to start with a challenge, uh, it, is, it is to me amazing to think that uh, if we stay on this trajectory, by 2030, our planet's gonna have 8.3 billion people. Uh, it's just an enormous dynamic. And it's also amazing to think that if we stay on this trajectory of increased uh, significant demand for water, food, and energy, that by 2030, there'll be 31 countries on this planet with a total of 1.4 billion people in them that will face both water scarcity and cropland scarcity. So this challenge is enormous, and it's, it's difficult to put it into numbers. Uh, you have to almost be there and see it. And uh, people like Peter Lockery that have spent a lifetime in the field uh, really touching the problem um, have a unique perspective of that. So in terms of the response uh, to all of this, we've talked about the nexus today. And uh, the nexus is basically a system. It's essentially how does food and energy and water come together. And just as an observation on systems, because I noticed there are a number of people here I think are still students or graduate students or beginning their careers, that this field of systems and systems management as it relates to food, water, and energy uh, is, is enormously significant. It's wide open, it's needed and very promising. And it's terribly complex because it's not just the macro systems of how to food, water, and energy you know, link in like a hydropower facility that produces water so we can have energy to help grow food. Um, but rather, it's the complex subsystems within each of these elements of food, water, uh, and energy, and how those subsystems come together uh, to really synergize. And it's an understanding of how systems lead to results. A system without a result is not a system. It's something else. It's an amoeba. Um, and it's how do the systems generate consequences and what are the anticipated failures and what are the anticipated successes and being able to evaluate them. And upon our ability to understand systems and to manage them, I think our ability to help feed the world, meet their energy needs or water needs or food needs is highly dependent. So one element of the system is water and at aid, I've had the privilege to work with a wonderful team of people within AID and in the stakeholders uh, community to develop AID's first water strategy. And AID basically will spend over a five-year period, when you look at its total spend on water, somewhere between $500 and $600 million a year. So over a five-year period, that gets up to $3 billion, which is a significant investment. And so as we began to develop the strategy, the first question I asked was, well, you know, and started to investigate with the team I was part of, where are the water systems? What do they look like? How are they formed? Um, and within the context of the development community, uh, it was hard to find a lot. Within the context of the work that Anders had done uh, at uh, CUE and others had done at the World Economic Forum, there was some groundbreaking work being done there, which I should acknowledge. But the field of understanding what constitutes a water system seemed to me to be surprisingly uh, general. There was a great, a great need for improvement. Uh, and it was a very difficult uh, uh, task to develop a strategy without having systems to refer to. So heuristically, we looked at systems that related to water, and we looked at the Bureau of Food Security System at AID, and the very interesting work they were doing on supply chain uh, and value chains and the integration of the two and identifying certain points along those chains to really make a difference. And I want to return to that in a moment. So the long and short of it is, um, to do a system, you have to have results, and we set a target of reaching 16 million people over five years with water, uh, with water and sanitation. 
Within the government context, that's hard to do because you're making a statement that there are going to be resources available over a five-year period to reach a specific target. But nevertheless, we were able to prevail and we got that agreed to. And then secondly, uh, a system without a focus just floats around. So within that context, we made a decision to come up with target countries and criteria based on need and opportunity to drive us towards those target countries to meet what we felt were the most pressing needs. And we tiered those countries. The first tier turned out to be very heavily focused in uh, Africa, in particular Kenya, Ethiopia, Nigeria, South Sudan, the DRC, and Liberia, which is where the bulk of the countries in that tier are. Um, we also adopted a number of approaches that we felt were pretty critical. Clearly, science, reliance on science, technology, innovation, and partnerships um, are the core to almost any approach we're taking at aid right now. But added to that are the principles of integration, uh, the engagement of women and the response to the unique requirements that women have in order, for example, uh, to, be given a, to be given opportunities in schools so that they can stay in schools uh, and cannot, young women, in the absence of proper water sanitation and hygiene. Uh, we took a very hard look as we went through this on the issue of sustainability and what constitutes sustainability and how do you achieve it. At the end of the day, the strategy was accepted um, and we've been in the process of implementing it. And let me tell you, having a systems approach has made the world of difference in what we do at aid because we can concentrate our resources where they need to be. Uh, this is not a perfect system. It's the beginning, but it's far better than where we were uh, before. The Congress picked up on the strategy and the system and decided they wanted to see it stay in place. And so on Christmas Eve, they codified it. It was only one of two bills uh, that were passed by unanimous consent in the last Congress. And I think that's very significant in terms of the commitment that we all have uh, to the development sector and to water, energy, and food. So to shift for a moment uh, to the science and technology side, which I know is of interest to you, um, clearly the engagement of partners and the reliance on market-based tools is critical to meeting needs of this enormity. And clearly we're going to need breakthroughs uh, of significant uh, size in order to be able to cope with these immense trajectories. You know, one of the critical trajectories is urbanization and particularly as it relates to coastal areas. And we look at that process right now, and most of the major coastal cities are deltaic. They're on major river systems. And the impact already of huge numbers of populations moving into these coastal areas and what it means for coastal aquifers, the salinization of the aquifers, and the destruction of marshlands in those areas, and how that relates to the sustaining of human populations is key. Um, and towards that end, uh, recently aid issued something known as a grand challenge for securing water. Uh, and that grand challenge has three calls. Um, one call was, was issued a year ago in conjunction with our partners, the Swedes and the Dutch. And uh, as a result of that call, we've already begun to develop, uh, not to develop actually, but to work with companies to bring to market seeds, for example, uh, that are highly resistant to saline soils and saline waters. Uh, particularly seeds that relate uh, uh, to the potato crops and quinoa, of all things, but uh, very needed. Um, secondly, we issued a call uh, about six months ago related to the development of technology that would deal with the desalinization of brackish water. And in so doing, uh, those technologies and those responses are coming in, and we'll be testing them in the field uh, this summer in New Mexico at the Bureau of Reclamation Center. I personally am extremely interested in the nexus, the link between desalinization and solar, because I think in many ways that's the holy grail. So many different solar applications as we proceed and go forward. The Bureau for Food Security in many ways has been a pathfinder and leader uh, in partnering, and they have an effort called Partners for Innovation. Uh, there are, I'm sure Margaret's discussed this, but just their work in drip tech irrigation alone but coming up with low energy required technologies and supporting a company called DripTech, uh, which has been extremely effective in India and elsewhere. And, and finally, I think you've heard about the powering for ag uh, uh, innovations that have been, been developed by aid where we're looking for ways in which to, to facilitate food production but by using clean, en clean energy. And recently, uh, we've been working with a company called Promethean Energy 
uh, that's been using a phase-based battery system in order to ensure significant improvements in the cooling of milk in rural areas in India. So those are just some snapshots of, uh, of where we are. So, you know, in summary, um, th these are really tough problems. And, you know, we're talking about dates of 2025. That's only 10 years from now. That's um, just right around the corner. And, and I think that uh, to really be impactful, the combination of understanding the problem, uh, uh, but particularly by using a systems-based approach to what you're doing, and the combination of, of really imaginably relying on a wide range of partners uh, and looking for uh, significant breakthroughs in both approaches as well as technology are going to mean the world difference to hundreds of millions of people. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Let's um, turn next to Peter, who really, who works with CARE, um, is director of CARE's water program, focuses a lot on the water and sanitation agenda, and love to hear from you. Good morning, uh, and many thanks to CSIS for the invitation to speak. I'm very happy to be here. Well, I'd love to talk about WASH and its relationship to uh, nutrition and, uh, uh, and to uh, agriculture, um, but I'm going to pull myself out of my comfort zone this morning and talk about uh, water for agriculture, the, the water food nexus uh, that we've been working on for the last uh, few years. Uh, you know, what happened about two and a half years ago is it became very clear that uh, CARE's focus on food and nutrition security, uh, if I was to uh, manage a water team, then I had to uh, pay attention to uh, the uh, water food uh, nexus. That's what uh, my internal clients uh, wanted. So we started thinking about it, and, you know, the first thing that uh, came to our attention was that this is a, you know, a complex global scale problem, um, which is difficult to represent in a, in a way that is both true and actionable. We tend to frame a problem from pre-existing perspectives that may omit vital clues to solutions. Nowhere is this truer than when trying to understand the complex issues concerning water, agriculture, energy, and development. In the early 2000s, the Stockholm World Water Week focused on the water crisis that seemed inevitable, given the projected need for more food, the thirst of agricultural systems, and the increasing scarcity of water for agriculture and other needs. Fifteen years later, and despite the passing of such programs as the CGIAR um, program, uh, Challenge Program for Water and Food, we seem little closer to full addressing some of the very important issues that arise. The main obstacle, so it seems to us, to a complete and actionable understanding of the problem that lies at the food and water nexus appears to be one of framing the problem. People still approach the problem from either a water, an agriculture, or a socioeconomic perspective. People rarely put all these fields together to support balanced and sustainable development. Ministries remain segregated into water or agriculture, and insight is streamed separately that way. You know, a recent paper by a leading agronomist describes the constraints to achieving potential crop yield. Water is mentioned, but not prominently. In fact, water is considered as a resource delivered to the crop rather than a resource shared within a much broader system. Water flows are omitted from this author's description of the system. Alternately, uh, a description from a water specialist adopts a more hydrologic perspective and focus on resource flows without identifying major changes in agricultural efficiency. Yet another paper strives for greater balance around the issues of food security, but does not intersect strongly with issues of either water or energy security. None of these views is correct. In, none of these views is incorrect, uh, but none is complete. To donors and collaborators, including governments, water for agriculture is a loose assemblage of concepts some of which have an unclear impact on development. Most donors and investors know that 70% of blue water is used for agriculture, but translating this to increased efficiency on the ground is challenging because of the variety of changes that are necessary, not the least of which is a better understanding and more efficient use of green water. If we want to attract investment, we have to do better in defining what works and what the benefits are. 
In our work, we try to identify the effect of changes that farmers can make to themselves and to global food and water security by drawing evidence together under an umbrella concept that we've called water smart agriculture, which is actually a series of concepts that bridge between different fields. Water smart agriculture imply, it includes multiple pathways to improvement of farming systems. Managing soil water to reduce drought risk is part of water smart agriculture. So too is using fertilizers to increase water use. So too is exploiting niche opportunities for high value crop. So too is rewarding farmers for protecting water supply. There are literally dozens of practices that could be classed as water smart agriculture. And therein, of course, lies the problem. What we've done is to try and develop four principles or behavior to guide activities towards a common goal of helping smallholder farmers escape poverty through better water management. Uh, although we've developed the principles and uh, behaviors, they're a guide. We're expecting, and we have expected, and the local groups have done this, they've developed local solutions, but within the boundaries of the principles. In other words, the principles are guiding, not prescriptive. The first principle is around uh, achieving optimality, assisting farmers to identify and apply the optimal water management regime based on improving water capture, storage and use, including from rainfall, surface flow and groundwater. The central feature of optimality is ensuring that the ultimate delivery system, the soils, are continually enhanced and supported in providing nourishment to crops. Second principle is ensuring sustainability. Water conservation and efficient use is central to water smart agriculture, but so is bringing more water into farming systems in order to capture opportunities for value enhancement, including in dry periods between established cropping seasons. Nevertheless, sustainability is a core principle, ensuring that resource utilization does not have negative environmental consequences elsewhere, that there are no deleterious trade-offs with other users or uses, such as domestic household supplies, and that the wider resource base can remain in equilibrium or be enhanced in the long term. Third principle is transitioning to prosperity. It's about using water more effectively and, equi and equitably to reduce risk for farmers, increase their value added, and seize otherwise unattainable opportunities to shift from low input output subsistence farming to more profitable and food secure production systems. A central core is the conviction that better water management is a key to unlocking future prosperity. And the fourth principle is building in learning and sharing. Water smart agriculture is smart through sharing and learning experience of what works within and between different contexts. Learning approaches, including working with farmers, extension systems, learning and practice alliances, farmer field schools, and other forms of sharing innovation are widely regarded as critical to enabling the uptake and dissemination of different approaches. This is an essential element of water smart agriculture and helps to create, maintain, and evolve practice that can inform policies at all levels. So what are we gaining uh, what are we guiding a behavior towards? What are the identifiable and quantifiable outcomes? There are four of them. First, very straightforward, to increase the productivity of water that's used by agriculture. Second is to increase the productivity to improve livelihoods. Third is to optimize use and minimize harm. And the fourth is to share and include. Well, it's still very much uh, a work in progress. And actually, I get quite nervous when we present it to a, an audience such as this. I'm sure that there are lots of holes in it, um, but maybe you'll uh, be kind in the way you ask questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I, you, you really drove home a number of points, I think, that everyone's hit on. And care is always such thoughtful. I'm sure much deliberated approaches to things, but um, one thing that you said in the beginning, which is your comfort zone, is is not this area. And I think that that is is really true across the board because these are three, if you want to throw in energy, deeply technical fields where people who are experts on water and on agriculture on energy are so technical that it's difficult to pull up from the very deep um, capabilities 
and start to look really more broadly and get a base level of understanding of the other two sectors in a way that helps people feel comfortable talking about them. So way to get out of your comfort zone. Everybody's going to need to get out of their comfort zone to get to the more systems approach that we've talked about. Um, I, I wanted to just follow up with the panel, and hello to you all over there. We won't forget you in the questions. Um, I want to just follow up on a couple of themes that came up, and then we'll open to audience questions in a few minutes. Um, a very important point that you made, Anders, is essentially that water saved is water gained. And for a long time, there's, there's always been discussion about pricing water and increasing pricing for water, but I think you've made a point that that probably is more promising, which is saving water and incentives to save water is a really important starting point. Um, the, the Millennium Challenge Corporation has a major effort to revive and, and um, sort of rebuild the water infrastructure in Morocco. It's an important piece of the MCC compact and trying to sell it to the public as, as you are buying into this. You're going to pay for your regular utility bills, but it's going to be a long-term investment in our success. Um, so, I want to ask each of you, or each of you who cares to comment about water systems and savings, I, I had just one more personal comment. I always felt that if you were in a water-rich area, you were really blessed. Here in Washington, one September, we had had 14 inches of rain, which is a bit more than we might want. But in speaking to someone who farms in California, he said, oh my gosh, we get 12 inches a year for lucky, and so far this year, we've got four. And it's great if you have a lot of water, but there's a lot that communities and countries can do to manage their resources through um, infrastructure, through practices. And I'd like to have anyone who would like to comment, maybe starting with you, Anders, to talk about some of those systems um, and maybe a little bit deeper on your comments about the no-drop approach in South Africa and some of the other ways you've looked at saving water rather than sort of trying to, to price it or look at other schemes. Thank you. Yeah, when, when we do some, some of the analytical work we do in, in countries, one of the pieces of analytical work would normally be a, a, a so-called marginal cost curve. And, and if you're an economist, that's sort of a standard uh, tool that you're using in, in uh, analyzing the cost effectiveness of various operations, of various interventions, sort of. Uh, and what we do normally in a, in a country where we are in a situation where we realize we need to, to really address various issues of, of saving water, various opportunities to, to save water, we do that kind of marginal cost curve analytics. And, and by doing that, we can actually identify what are the most cost effective levers. And surprisingly enough, uh, for some of those interventions, uh, you realize that you would not only save water by doing them, but also actually saving uh, economically by doing them. And in particular, those that have a, a high cost of energy involved in them, such as pumping water uh, long distances, etc. Uh, you would actually save also economically. And, and surprisingly enough, none, none have really uh, sort of been able to act on, on those issues based on, on these kind of analytics before. And I think it's basically, basically because the, the relationship uh, between sort of water and the economic dimensions of it has, is not fully understood. So we take sort of normally a, quite an economic approach to this. We have been criticized for that also uh, because there are so many other aspects uh, around uh, sort of the the choice of various interventions that needs to be made. Uh, there are the social implications. There might be environmental implications. There might be even political implications when it comes to, to uh, sort of water allocation, etc. So we realized that uh, it's much broader than, than having just an economic perspective on, on the various uh, choices that we have to make. Uh, but we, we start with the economic dimension and then put the facts and figures on the table for these kind of multi-stakeholder platforms that we have to themselves discuss and, and come up with the best solutions, uh, putting all the social, environmental, political dimensions on the table. But indeed, uh, in, in many of those cases, we can come up with very uh, cost-effective solutions. Uh, I mentioned some of them. Uh, the no-drop program in South Africa is uh, 
a continuation of, of some other governmental programs that they've had for uh, the uh, municipal water supply system. They only had a, a, a so-called blue drop uh, program, which was about the coverage of water to, uh, to citizens. Then they had a green drop uh, program, uh, which was focusing on the quality of, of the water that was distributed. And now they came up with this no drop program, which means that now we have to cut the losses of, of water in our systems. And, and uh, they are rolling out that uh, now. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incentive scheme uh, that is uh, monitoring the performance of all the municipalities and then publicly disseminating the results. So it's really about naming and shaming the mayors. No mayor wants to be at the bottom of the list when it comes to the performance of, of his water utility. So it's, it's a sort of political incentive, coupled then with also economic incentives from the government to municipalities. And already today, um, I think it is eight of the bigger municipal, municipal sort of areas that have signed up to reduce the leakage, which is actually covering 90% of the bulk water supply in South Africa, to reduce the leakage with 50% within three or four years. Great. And if, do others want to comment on um, sort of behavior modification, conservation practices, other ways to save and better utilize water? In the, in the, let me give you two examples, challenges in the urban and then uh, in the rural context. So in the urban context where we see these massive migrations uh, occurring right now and will, will continue to occur, um, a, a huge problem is essentially how do you maintain, if you, have, if you have pipe systems either on a distributed basis or on a larger basis in the urban area, is A, how do you maintain the pipes, and B, how do you recover your costs? Uh, unrecovered water, unrecovered cost is something known as non-revenue water. It's a massive problem, and it's a disincentive to having effective utilities provide water unless that problem can be, com can be overcome. So to save water in that context means interventions where you are building up the local capacity of utilities in large and small cities and utilities within even smaller environments. And to do that, um, it requires one, uh, working very closely with governments on the capacity building. Two, it requires a lot of patience because I talked about results earlier, but in some cases when you enhance the capacity of an entity like a utility, it's hard to show immediate results uh, and an impact uh, based on your, on your uh, financial contribution. But I think this, uh, this focus, this increased focus on utility capacity strengthening to save water is absolutely critical. And that relates both to the urban areas and peri-urban areas where there's been some extension of pipes. Um, in the rural areas, one of the most important things is to make the argument that there's a reason to save water on a, on a projected out basis. Everybody in the middle of a drought knows there's a reason to save water, but sometimes that's too late. But by making a projection into the future and working with farmers and showing the ways in which to save water based upon that projection, great things can happen. So there's a program that we at AID have supported with other partners called the Productive, Productive Safety Net Program, PSNP. And that was based essentially on taking a look at FuseNet, which is the famine early warning system, remote sensing system, projections as to the likelihood of drought in targeted regions in Ethiopia identifying a population of six million people that the Ethiopian government, other partners felt were particularly vulnerable, uh, and then taking that data and making the argument that A, there had to be something done financially, you know, in terms of how you're gonna use your aid funds to support things like water catchments, which are pretty critical to the savings, and secondly, working with local farmers to help them make tough decisions like really sell off part of their livestock in anticipation of less water for themselves and their livestock. The, th the second area in the rural context is uh, saving water but using very traditional means uh, to do so. And catchments, of course, are pretty traditional. So we have a project called uh, 
uh, farmer-based natural resource uh, regeneration. And it's been going on in West Africa for some time, in Mali in particular. And it's essentially focused on taking traditional technologies for water capture and water saving them and bringing them back, in essence. And these technologies uh, include something known as Zai catchments, Z-A-I. And they're really simple pits. They're two feet deep and about three feet wide um, that are put into hard pack uh, in, in areas where you know rains will come, but it's very hard to capture that rain. Um, but by doing that and having these pits ready for the rainfall and lining the pits with whatever leaves you can find for nitrogen fixation, miraculous things occur in terms of supporting uh, both crops and ultimately tree production through those pits and the regeneration of groundwater. So those are a few ways of approaching this. Uh, a few years ago, we uh, worked on uh, a local water management uh, program in uh, the Middle East, in Egypt, on the West Bank, and uh, in Jordan. And in Egypt, I think, uh, thanks to a sort of very far-sighted minister at the time, uh, we had uh, sort of significant impact on uh, water management down to the tertiary uh, canals in Egypt. At the tertiary canal level, we just couldn't get over the fact that uh, people have been irrigating using flood irrigation, turning the water on in the morning, going to market, coming home, turning it off, and that's how they uh, irrigated. We just couldn't uh, find a way of sort of incentivizing a change. They had the rights and they were going to uh, use those uh, rights. And the implications for the people, uh, the farmers downstream, was that they didn't get any uh, irrigation water. They had to use drainage water. Uh, sort of more recently, uh, because we've started talking to our uh, agricultural colleagues in uh, Egypt, we figured out that you know, with a, a set of interventions, some of which are about uh, the water saving lining canals, some are about uh, improved prop um, varieties, uh, 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 sort of reducing uh, uh, evaporation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, we've now got a package of uh, interventions that uh, not only uh, saves 25% uh, uh, of the water, but uh, also in substantially increases the productivity of the farmers. So there's a huge incentive for the farmers to buy in. I mean, that's the power of the nexus in my mind. I mean, you should say that you should have realized that three or four years ago, well, we didn't, uh, because we weren't talking to the right people. Uh, we were talking to the Ministry of Water and not to uh, the Ministry of Agriculture. But to me, that's a small example of the, of the power of the, uh, the nexus. Thank you. I, I'm just gonna draw a quick comparison between water saved is water gained in the, in the food domain it was mentioned uh, in the previous panel that the estimated 30% post-harvest losses in food in developing countries, that's, that's the easiest food gain just by covering, just by cleaning and drying on a plastic sheet, reducing the losses by half causes a 15% increase in food supply with, with further on gains in nutrition. Water saved is water gained. Food not lost is food available. And probably water saved and because water the water saved. has not been yes, wasted. Yes, because it's all of the resources. It's labor, it's, it's, it's finance that's gone into producing it. Tragic to lose a third of it after you harvest. And, and I think Dan will talk about this, but he's going to have a report out on reducing post-harvest loss and some approaches to that in the next month or so. So that's um, a, a good follow-up discussion. I'm going to stand here so I don't miss the folks on this side of the room for our uh, Q&A period. Let's bundle a few questions. Uh, we can start with Tony and then woman in the uh, red jacket and then over here in the gray. Hi, I'm Tony Carroll. I'm an associate here at the uh, Africa Studies Program, among many other things. Anders, um, you threw out the issue of sanitation, but not much discussion ensued from that. And I'm wondering about the evolution of technological solutions in sanitation, uh, moving from sort of macro to micro solutions. One of the things that keeps me up at night is um, 
the infrastructural demands in urbanization in Africa particularly. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, water supply is certainly a big issue, but the implications on health, public health, particularly from bad sanitation, are, are potentially catastrophic. So uh, perhaps with your, your welter of experience in water and research, I'm wondering what you can inform us or enlighten us on the area, breakthroughs in, in sanitation, because if, if Africa's urbanizing at the rates that it's urbanizing, um, we've got real challenges. Yeah, hi, I'm Jennifer Bremer from Arizona State University. Uh, in addition to um, you know, the importance of saving water, I would also say that water saved is energy saved because so frequently for cities, um, energy is mostly being used to move water and which is extremely expensive. So as water services and sand extends, it becomes a real budget problem. So there's also very definitely an energy money water linkage. Great, okay, I think we found another nexus here, good. Um, and the next question. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm Darcy O'Callaghan from Food and Water Watch. Um, my question slash comment is also directed to uh, Anders Bruntel. So the data shows that household water consumption is not responsive to changes in price. Um, and, and on the flip side of that, uh, agricultural use and industrial use is very price responsive. So I'm curious to know uh, what your plans are regarding the tariffs in Peru. And is it not controversial for, uh, even though it's a multi-stakeholder initiative, uh, for the 2030 Water Resources Group to be engaged in those conversations around uh, tariffs and pricing? Isn't that something that should be left for uh, the folks who live in the watershed and the government? Okay, so we had a bundle of questions. We're gonna to come to back to you in the next round. So let's take those questions. Um, whoever would like to respond first. And not everyone has to respond. Christian, go ahead, uh, just hit your button. Make sure to put your microphone on. So on breakthroughs uh, in sanitation, that's a very tough problem. Uh, to put it mildly, and, much, and in some ways more difficult than breakthroughs in, in water treatment. Um, I, I, think, I think the breakthroughs are going to be kind of in three areas. One will, will definitely be in the treatment of human feces, um, and we've done some work through a partnership with Gates called Wash for Life, where we're looking at ways in which to, build, to treat uh, human waste in such a way that it can be converted into a marketable commodity. And that's kind of the holy grail that some way something can be done fairly simply and safely to be able to convert waste into something that can be used for uh, 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 agriculture and other purposes. Um, to go back to the point about systems, uh, AIDS got a, a global development laboratory that was launched about a year ago. They've identified an initial set of high priority problem sets where People are trying to really delve down into what is the problem uh, around a certain development need. And so urban sanitation is one of the first problem sets that they've been launching, and I've been working on that. And we're right back to trying to understand the system as it relates to sanitation in very large urban areas. And, and what, are the what are the breakdowns and the flaws? And until we understand that better and the gaps, um, it's very difficult to move ahead. And so. We're in that process. I think, I think knowledge in terms of the impact of sanitation on the human system uh, is critical because it, A, it helps us survive, and B, it makes a stronger case for why sanitation programs are so critical. So I think the groundbreaking work in my judgment that's being done by Dr. Jean Humphrey at Johns Hopkins University on environmental enteropathy and better understanding the migration of E. coli uh, from in, human feces being ingested, moving into the gut and then into the blood system, and how it in turn relates to proteins and impacts uh, both cognitive and physical growth uh, is critical. And I think the further work, the more we understand about the dynamic of what goes on on the interrelationships between different pathogens and chemicals in the human system that are ingested, uh, where the vectors are uh, either feces um, or some other uh, a compound or organism in untreated water, 
um, is also absolutely critical to both protect people and to make a better case for why sanitation should be very high on the list. Uh, Christian, did you want to comment, and then Paul? Uh, well, thank you. Um, on, firstly, on, on the issue of sanitation, just to, to make the point that we as a group uh, are not established to, to address sort of um, providing of, of uh, drinking water and sanitation to, to rural areas. We are focusing on the challenges of the water resource as such, so that's our starting point. Uh, nevertheless, we do work on, on, in particular, wastewater issues in, in the urban settings. And uh, where we do have programs now where we will develop uh, both methodologies but also financial solutions for sort of PPPs to, to collect the wastewater produced more effectively and then make sure that we can reuse and recycle to other kinds of uses within industry or for agricultural purposes, etc. So that's one focus area that, that we are working on. Um, in general, I think when it comes to, to uh, providing uh, treatment of wastewater and, and uh, uh, well, wastewater in developing countries and, and the rapidly expanding uh, cities that we see around the world. I don't think it's a viable model to replicate the kind of systems that we have in North America or Europe. The big centralized solutions that we are used to here where we collect the wastewater from everywhere into one central point and, and then treat it there. I think we need to, to look for more decentralized solutions where we can close the loop uh, within smaller geographical areas. I think that's the, the way forward when it comes to, to handling of wastewater. Um, on, on sort of the more, even more small-scale sanitation solutions, I, I think that there are opportunities indeed for turning human waste into a commodity. And I'm aware of some NGOs that actually have worked quite effectively in doing that, uh, teaming up with uh, companies that are producing fertilizers or or improved soil and selling that. And actually, I think it's a, a, an American NGO, uh, Water for People, that has been developing that uh, methodology quite effectively, uh, where the company that is producing these fertilizers and, and improved soil is actually providing or selling the toilet, the EcoSan toilet, to families, and they are paying with their waste. Uh, for it, which is uh, quite innovative. And after a certain time, uh, the toilet has been paid, and actually the family can then sell their waste and, and get financial uh, compensation for it, um, which I think is a very good idea. Um, on the issue of pricing, um, actually the, the uh, focus of our work there on improving the, the tariff system and increasing the level of the tariffs is for the industrial use, so it's not for the household use. Uh, and, and it's uh, quite clear that, I mean, we will not have the industry sitting and discussing with the government what the level of tariffs for individual consumers in households should be. It's, it's for the industrial commercial use of, of water that they are discussing. But even that is, is quite innovative. And I know, for example, in Mongolia, where the Minister of, of Green Growth, Environment, Development, uh, Water, <laughs> Um, told us that she had had that struggle within the cabinet, within the government, uh, where ministries of energy and industry and so on, and so on had opposed the, the higher levels of tariffs. So that was, of course, music to her ears when she could come back to her uh, minister colleagues and say that, well, now we have a request from the private sector to actually change the tariff structure in our country and increase the levels uh, for their own use. And, and I think that will be extremely interesting to see when we get the proposal ready and, and uh, moving towards implementation. Thank you. Okay, Paul and then Peter. Uh, a quick comment. I, I'm, I'm seeking the, the holy grail of the food, water, energy nexus. Um, from the food perspective, it's, it's fairly clear that investment drives conservation. 
the, whether this is in coffee washing stations or irrigated food crop commercialization, the, the markets call for sanitation standards, uh, sanitary phytosanitary trade regulations, uh, certification programs, uh, traceability requirements, all drive the more financial considerations of a food business. The investment means water savings, energy savings, ultimately cost savings that make good business sense. That's my comment. Concisely put, thank you. A few years ago, there was a, a paper written on um, how access to sanitation in the UK plotted uh, GDP. So there is a sort of ongoing debate amongst you know, people who uh, work in the sanitation field as to whether we can buck the trend or not, whether we can, uh, you know, we can move faster than that in, uh, in the developing world. And I would say that we are already bucking the trend. And I think the, one of the big reasons is uh, uh, it's because uh, the private sector is beginning to engage in uh, sanitation. For example, you see uh, you know, organizations in Nairobi uh, uh, franchising uh, toilets, fresh life toilets. Uh, you see others working on uh, marketing or treating and marketing uh, um, excreta, ex, uh, fe fecal material, uh, and also looking at uh, you know how uh, urine uh, can be uh, utilised. So I think you know the signs are there that uh, we are backing the trend, and we are going to do better than the uh, UK and the developing world. We're not going to just be limping along with GDP, but we are going to uh, see some more rapid change. It occurs to me that while agriculture people can't help but talk about manure, sanitation and water people cannot help but talk about toilets. Um, we are running up against lunch, so what I'm going to do, we're going to do a lightning round, take three or four questions. I'm going to give each person 60 seconds to respond, and then we'll close for lunch. So um, the gentleman here had his hand up before, and let me see who else would like to put out a question. Oh, a woman right here will be next. Okay. A very excellent insight from the panels. Thank you. My question is, uh, is to Paul uh, about building farmers' capacity, uh, building awareness for supply skills for farmers. How do you begin that? Where do you start? Also, you mentioned replication of our innovation. Uh, could you name more models? And then to Peter, the water smart agriculture, is, is that a replicable model? Could you pass the microphone right to the gentleman next to you? We'll take that question next. Um, Reed Mackey, Child Labor Coalition. I was wondering if um, there are some crops that use a lot of water, or some of them use a lot of child labor, like cotton. Um, alfalfa um, uh, is not one that uses a lot of child labor, but um, are, are, there, are we reaching a point where there are crops that need to be phased out because they use so much water and water is becoming so precious? Um, interesting, so woman in the pink sweater, interesting question when we hear, think about rice production. Uh, my name is Julia Tuakaria. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Mr. Holm. Uh, I'm from Mali. And where I grew up, we really don't have no water. We used to, as young girl, wake, wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, going to the well to get water. And uh, up to now, the, our area is still, everybody knows Mali is a landlord. And we have three months of rain. So when Mr. Anda is talking about saving water, we, really, we didn't even have enough. So I would thank Mr. Holm of actually having a program of saving water in Mali. But my question is, most of this program that we are talking about water saving or about water is like for the uh, city center or the urban area. And uh, as my friend here is talking about the agriculture, agriculture and water is linked together. Having three months of rain in a country of a landlord where they know we don't, we maybe one river going across the country, other area does not have a river, how to deal with a problem like that? Thank uh, you. Excellent question. So you each have 60 seconds to wrap up your response. Anders, we're going to let you start and we're going to go down the line. Well, thank you. I, I will start with the last uh, question there. I mean, how do you save water when there is no water? Um, 
which is very good. And, and I think in, in some of the countries that we are working in, there is water, uh, but only for a very limited time period. So you have a, a peak of maybe one and a half month when the rain comes, and then it's dry the rest of the year. We're working in Tanzania, where actually, uh, according to, to the, the calculations that we have made, 80% of the water that is falling down as rain over the country is lost. Uh, going out the, with the rivers and not put into any kind of practical use uh, or economic use. So that's the main challenge for that country. It's like you have a, a huge uh, gold reserve and 80% and of it is, is actually not used. So what we're doing there is to improve, improve the storage capacity uh, and putting in, in programs where we can increase the storage at community level, at, at the small scale. It's not about the big uh, dams, uh, infrastructure investments, it, it's at the local level uh, where you can actually make sure that you can store that valuable resource that is given to us. Thank you. 60 seconds to add. The, the driver for, for farmer behavior change, uh, the, the, the tautology, the universal truth is that farmers the world over really simply want to feed their families and educate their children. Uh, we find the successful MO to be community level group action, helping people realize that they have common problems, common challenges, and, and, and building trust that some of those problems can best be overcome by working together. Uh, the three-month rainy season, obviously, you have to optimize your crop, and the, the three-month farmer hopes to feed his family for the following nine months and have sufficient seed remaining to plant a new crop. I think that there are, there are two measures there. One is, first of all, you optimize your crop the simple measures of, of planting in rows and cultivating with improved varieties will give you a larger yield. Then, then reduce the losses. During that nine month period, preventing the birds, the rats, the moisture uh, from turning your food to poison uh, is going to be the next secret. There, there's no trick about it. Simple methodologies, drying better in the sun before hermetically sealing uh, will prevent the losses. Christian. Sorry, as Andrew said, there's, there are ways to capture water. Uh, and I've seen things in my lifetime which are almost miraculous, where there are parts of the world that you wouldn't think could survive that uh, almost look like Edens in terms of the way in which they have been able to capture it. Um, how you transfer that knowledge to different parts around the world is a big challenge, to say the least. I, I do think that uh, there's then the second question, once you've captured it, is how to use it far more efficiently than it's ever been used before. And that gets into these, uh, I think, relatively rapid developments and improvements in technologies such as drip irrigation. Um, at the same time, uh, to stay with the theme of water shortages and capturing water and using it, and to your point, uh, sir, about uh, alternate crops, um, that's a big piece of the equation. And so the work that's being done uh, drought-resistant uh, seeds and some of the progress that Aid and Margaret and her team have had on uh, drought-resistant maize um, are pretty critical, um, as well as uh, enabling people to make a decision to switch to something else uh, when the environment becomes too stressed. So I think some of the work we've been doing on uh, introducing highly salt-resistant strains of quinoa, which has a, twice the protein content as rice, uh, into Vietnam um, is right kind of in a track that uh, is in line with that. And Peter. You asked whether water smart agriculture is a replicable model. I think the answer is it's not really a model. We're just following a, a track that has been successful in the past. And I would sort of summarize it as create a safe space. Uh, increased discussion between the actors, both on the water and the agriculture side. Uh, frame the problem. 
um, build consensus and uh, build consensus on and agree uh, principles. And then finally, what we're trying to do, of course, is to uh, attract investment by government, uh, private sector, and not least the farmers themselves. Because uh, you have managed to convince people that what is proposed leads to water savings and uh, increased uh, productivity. Thank you so much. So we really, just as you go to lunch, thinking about knowledge transfer, how to improve water savings through new and old technologies and solutions, um, improving cross-sector knowledge, and, and to Peter's point, getting out of your comfort zone. So you have deep technical sectoral knowledge, but you can come back and look across sectors as you think about solutions to the, the challenges ahead. You have an incredible wealth and depth of expertise here on the panel. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. Um, I think lunch is outside, and we have until 12.45 for lunch, but let's thank our panel. Thank you very much.